What we have demonstrated throughout the last two decades, roughly, is that an infertile man is less healthy than a fertile man. So the longer the length of infertility, the higher the probability of having comorbid conditions. I would say that in Western society, sperm count is declined and uh, testicular cancer is increased. Endocrine disrupting chemicals may be linked to testicular dysgenesis syndrome and decreased fecundity. And I would like to highlight the importance of preconceptional health, not only for females, but also for males regarding um, endocrine disruptors. I'm excited now to uh, open a debate on uh, low intensity shockwave therapy for uh, erectile dysfunction. Gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble. Elon, please present the pro. You know, we treat hypertension by giving medications, we're not curing it. We treat diabetes by giving medications or insulin, but we're not curing it. And we need to change this paradigm. And shockwave therapy does this. Time to talk about male fertility and erectile dysfunction now. And fresh from a plenary session, we have, uh, first of all, on the left, Professor Jens Songson, Adjunct Secretary General of the EAU for Clinical Practice, and also Dr. Mikkel Fodder, who is from the Herlev Jentofte Hospital in Denmark. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So if we look at the erectile dysfunction first, and if I can come perhaps to yourself, Jens, um, we were talking about um, shockwave therapy, for and against. Yes. So what are the arguments for? First of all, I had to say it was a very strong session because we had really both sides represented. And I think uh, the, the pro discussion was much, very much about why not try this because there's no side effects, so just go ahead. Uh, on the other side, I think uh, Dr. Fodor was really giving a very strong statement about uh, evidence-based medicine, and we need stronger studies, clinical randomized stronger studies, before we are taking this to the clinical practice. And Dr. Fodor, I mean, uh, you were arguing against we don't have enough evidence yet, but it's been adopted as EAU guidelines, so you want a bit of a losing argument there. <laughs> Well, I think uh, ESWT is a very exciting uh, new potential treatment for erectile dysfunction. Uh, there are some animal studies that suggest that we may uh, be able to create new blood vessels in the penis and, and potentially cure uh, vasculogenic erectile dysfunction. So, so this is a very exciting treatment because it's potentially curable and there are really no detectable side effects. On the other hand, if we look at the studies, uh, a lot of them, uh, the effect that they can measure, it comes very close to uh, placebo and there are really a lot of discrepancies when we look at the findings in the randomized trials. So I don't think that the evidence is, uh, is very strong, uh, certainly. There's another big problem with, uh, with this uh, ESWT shockwave therapy for erectile dysfunction. There are a number of different devices on the market and most of them has not been tested. In, uh, in any kind of uh, randomized trial, and, and we don't know exactly how to apply the treatment. So my argument was that before we take this into the normal clinical practice, we really need more trials on the, on the subject. All right, need more research to be done there, but we were talking generally about male fertility and age. I will say it's not the biggest problem with the age, but we have another factor which plays, plays uh, in, in a very important role, and that is we, during the last 50 years, have seen very strong studies indicating that the semen quality is going down. And that has changed the look into this because that is a huge factor. So I think a strong message from us, also from EAU, will be to be much more aware and bring this to the younger generation, put it into the school. You have, you have to teach them about this serious problem because this is going to create a very, very serious problem in the Western world uh, because we cannot uh, have the level for, for the population in, in, a, in a balance. And so really think about having children earlier. We were also thinking about the impact on the environment, so chemicals that are in the environment. I don't know whether you heard that particular talk, if I can ask you about that. What was the main thrust of that argument? Well, that's been a theory for a number of years that, that a lot of pollutants in the environment actually affect male fertility from the time that the male fetus is in the womb of his mother, his fertility may be uh, affected. But it's very, very difficult to isolate what kind of chemicals or, or pollutants are really doing this. That's extremely difficult research to do. 
And then there's another uh, quite political thing that as soon as we get um, good data on, on, on any kind of pollutant or chemical that might be dangerous, that might be forbidden by the authorities, but then what comes into play is another potential pollutant that we know even less about, which may be worse. So actually it may not be the answer to ban these substances, because then other substances would come in which may be worse. It's certainly a very, very difficult topic, and I think, I mean, from a scientific standpoint, we should have some research on the substances uh, that we're using, but this is just very difficult in a society like ours. Well, gentlemen, both of you, thank you very much.